Okay. So um, where we left off last week was with early adulthood, and we were learning about how our attachments and how our, our cognitive development and our even our physical growth kind of led us into relationships, right? If you remember from last week, our brains haven't fully formed. Our prefrontal cortex is, is still developing into early adulthood, which meant that our judgments are still solidifying, right? Our, our moral development is still uh, developing. We're, we're going through these changes, physiological and emotional and personality changes through our early adulthood. When we get to middle adulthood, things are pretty much where they're going to be. With a few minor exceptions, uh, we do have some changes that occur a little bit later on in life with empty nesting um, and, and what we know today or what we consider to be like midlife crises. Some people may uh, have uh, may be showing those more than others, right? So um, what we're going to see, though, is for the most part, we're really stable throughout that. And that's kind of what this assignment uh, deals with the, with the big five this week is it's talking about where we lie on each one of those factors because those remain, pretty, especially conscientiousness. We don't really change much in conscientiousness, right? If we are, are uh, generative towards people and, and conscientious towards the well-being of others, that tends to carry over throughout our entire lives unless something happens, right? We, could, we might experience some kind of trauma or major life event that, that uh, really pushes us to make some changes or adjustments to our personality so that we don't get wounded again. And that's, um, your, you know, your book kind of delved a little bit into personality types with Freud, right? And uh, that would be an example of defense mechanisms for that. But we're not going to go uh, too much into personality. We're going to talk about some major life changes that kind of mold uh, I, I'm not going to say mold, but interact with our personality. Our personality interacts with our development um, through through some of these changes. So let me share my screen here so you can follow along with some of the notes that I'm going to be taking. Um, okay. All right, so um, during middle adulthood, there are really a lot of social uh, and emotional and even personality changes that are affected by the growing age of, of uh, our children and also the deteriorating, deteriorating health that could be seen. Uh, and that's often seen by the parents of the individuals uh, in order for us to be able to provide assistance to the generations that came before us. Um, and those that came after us. Now, we need to have successfully completed the generative versus stagnation, uh, according to Eric Erickson, if you remember, um, the eight stages of psychosocial development. We can only give back to those that came after us if we've found a sense of intimacy and we have a stable identity as, uh, as to who we are in order for us to be able to give back to those and be able to provide um, uh, a stable life. So um, one of the, if we look at Erickson, um, his stage of development is generativity versus stagnation. Generativity versus stagnation. Okay. Um, and, and when we're looking at middle adulthood, you're going to hear a lot of different like competing ideas of when this usually occurs. Generally, according to Erickson, we're looking like about 20 to 40 years of age. Okay. Now, depending, depending on the uh, theory that you're using or whatever model you're using, you might hear that it might be 30 to 45 or 30 to 65 or something like that. And the reason is uh, the reason being is because everybody kind of goes through this a little bit differently. And uh, it might be deterministic on culture, right? Uh, it might be deterministic on, um, on socioeconomic status or education or something like that, right? So every person uh, really goes through uh, these stages, especially when we get to talks about midlife crisis and empty nest goes through that a little bit differently. Uh, depending on the, the age, okay? But uh, according to Erickson, we, uh, uh, 
get the sense of value value about how we contribute to society and uh, bring up children and mentoring young people. And that's really what generativity is. Now, the balance between those is, um, are, are we able to provide that sense of belonging? And do we feel that sense of a belonging? And do we, uh, are we being part of society? And this relates to mental health among uh, middle-aged adults as well, right? Um, so uh, we, we look at jo our job satisfaction. So generativity might have something to do with job satisfaction. Might have to do with quality of relationships we have. Now relationships could be, again, um, from those that uh, came before us, like our, our parents, we may want to re-engage during this age. We want, want to re-engage with uh, uh, quality, high quality relationship with our parents. If we have children, we're gonna try and um, rationalize and negotiate having good relationships with them as well, right? But um, th this really, goes through the, the paces of like, this goes beyond identity. We've established our identity. Now we're looking at how we can belong to those around us and fit into society at, at some point. All right. So let me ask you, what, what do you know about midlife crises? Has anybody uh, either heard of that or, or knows what that is? Like, a crisis where um, you start questioning, uh, like what you're what you're gonna do or who you are right now. Okay, okay. So, so kind of uh, going back to that identity, uh, uh, trying to figure out who we are is is what I'm hearing, right? What What are some signs? So, what are some signs that you may have either heard or read about that identify uh, that somebody might be going through a midlife crisis? going to like extremes like they'll they'll change their appearance that's like the opposite of what what you've seen them before as or they'll be doing like risky stuff like oh i went on a cruise or i'm going skydiving uh, okay so risky behaviors okay um i i heard like uh uh like drastic changes like maybe in in uh how they dress What else? What, what other things might you see in? Making in expensive life? purchases. Okay, okay. Irrational purchases, right? Feel good. Now, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Are you writing something in your screen? Because I, I am, think... is it not showing? My apologies. No, okay, no, thank it's you. Not showing. Okay, how about now? Yes, now. No, it's, it's, All right. Thank you. So let, let me uh, let, let me go back to my previous screen here, so you can can if anybody wants to take notes or screenshot it or whatever else. Uh, but Erickson during this stage was generativity versus stagnation. We look at about twenty to forty years, according to Erickson, might be a little bit different depending on other models that are out there. Okay. All right. Are we good to move on. Anybody's writing notes or whatever, I can give you a few more minutes if you, or a few more seconds if you need it. Yes, thank you. I got it. Okay. Look, are, you, are you good, Samir? Yes. Yeah, okay. I took a picture. Okay, good, good. All right. So uh, midlife crises, okay. Um, it, it's often been debated as to whether this really exists or if it's something that's just fiction and may be used as an excuse that uh, th this, it's believed to be brought on about a constellation of difficult tasks. And they're often presented in midlife. And this is the point uh, in which we really have to begin to accept our own mortality, right? So um, you might even hear that. That might be a, another feature. I'm just going to write feature over here because these are features that we see with midlife crises, right? Um, uh, like denial of mortality, right? You hear that a lot. Because um, when we're younger, especially like adolescents, we feel that death is, is uh, part of life, right? We know that. We, we kind of accept that as uh, even as teenagers, we know it's coming, but it is so far from us. 
And, and now we get to midlife and we realize that we're actually close and, and we've never really been able to wrap our minds around it, but we begin to realize that maybe we have not completed a lot of the tasks that we wanted to, right? And if you kind of think back, and we talked about this last week uh, with early adulthood, is we have these ideals that we're going to be millionaires, or we're going to be maybe president of the United States, or or you know some some astronomical thing, right? Or, or uh, like. Um, uh, an all-star in NBA, right? We just have these fantasies of what our lives are going to be look like. And as we get older, those ideals, they start to diminish, right? And when we get to midlife, uh, our midlife, we start understanding that, yeah, you know, time is kind of ticking. There might be fewer days ahead than there are uh, behind us. And, and that gets uh, kind of tricky for some people to negotiate. So they may deny their mortality. Uh, but they get a sense of wanting to complete things that uh, that really got them to where they are today, but they haven't really gotten through to, to maybe have a bucket list or something like that. that that's something that we hear as people want to go to Europe before they, they retire or, or, or die or something like that. But this can lead to a crisis recognizing our own physical limitations, right? Maybe we're not able to go take jumps off of uh, off the ski slope or go skydiving anymore. But this is a quick reminder that um, uh, that adaptation to major changes in our roles um, it's going to lead us to really spreading ourselves too thin, which could bring about a sense of anxiety for some people. So we might see that as a feature. Anxiety, like sleeplessness, right? We, we do know that we tend to sleep less when we uh, uh, get a little bit older. This could be part of that, right? Because we have our, our futures to think about, right? Um, stress. Uh, that uh, uh, through crises, through this crisis stage, are typically triggered by events. Um, so it might have something to do with job loss, right? So I'm going to write triggers here. Job loss or even retirement. Now, now, hopefully some of you have already thought about retirement, but for those of you that, that may be getting a little bit up there in age, you know, I'm kind of getting up there and realizing, geez, maybe I should have saved a little bit more, right? Um, so that could be a trigger is realizing how much, uh, how much you really have financially uh, in your financial responsibilities coming up on retirement or job loss as we get a little bit older it might be harder for us to get jobs, right? Unfortunately, we say that age discrimination is not a thing, but it exists. You now, uh, people do uh, get discriminated on because of their age. Um, they might be overqualified uh, to, to hold certain positions. And if a company is looking for the cheapest option, newest, better educated options, they're going to go with the younger generation. It happens. You know, like I said, it's not supposed to, but I think we all know that it does occur. Uh, with different industries. Um, another trigger might be death of a friend or relative, right? That might, uh, that, that might trigger some ideas of their own mortality, um, which will lead to, again, that anxiety and uh, trying to get as much done as possible. We, uh, during these ages, we might also have um, um, difficulties with, with relationships or marriages, right? Relationship difficulties. Why do you think, what, what are some reasons that you think that we would have relationship difficulties in middle age? Any ideas? A lot of people get divorces. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we, we do. We do. Go ahead. I thought, thought you were still talking. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we do see uh, divorce rates uh, in, in middle age. We, we don't necessarily see them spike any more than any other age. But what happens when we're in early adulthood is relationships are new. They're great. They're shiny. They're fantastic, right? Sex life is good. Um, money is, is probably building. They're excited about their future. And when we get into um, a little bit later through these midlife crisis, uh, crises, we might see 
some difficulties occur. We might see some stagnation, right? Going back to that stagnation term there. So um, middle adulthood is really riddled with changes in relationships and but not only relationships, but personality. Uh, oops. All right. So um, oftentimes we might see that that children um, have uh, uh, typically they, they, a lot of marriages or relationships, they might have children. This can often make individuals feel overwhelmed. Um, uh, one, I, I did want to go back to one last point with midlife crises. So like I said, we're, we're really kind of looking at this as whether it's a, a myth or a fact. And we do see these features in some people in midlife. And that could vary anywhere from age early 40s to uh, late 50s or even later. Um, so well, we'll just put like 40 plus. Um, you know, it could be up to, you know, 60, 65, maybe even later. But one of the things that we do know is that people with a history of depression likely face these uh, midlife crises or tasks a little bit more negative. So if there's an increase, um, if, if, if there's a history, I'm sorry, yeah, let me, let me change that. So if we have a history of depression or anxiety, that really oftentimes leads to increased risk of, oops, risk of these features up here. So we're going to see riskier behavior. We're going to see drastic changes. We're going to see irrational feel-good purchases, deny mortality, increased anxiety, right? We're going to see a lot of these features in people that have a history of depression already. And that could be chemical reasons. That could be uh, emotional reasons or, or lack of tools, right? So the good thing is that uh, with, with some kind of, with a good support network and good healthy lifestyle uh, changes, they might be able to turn this around and be okay with this. All right, so I did wanna mention that with midlife crisis because that does play also into how we manage our relationships later on in life. And, and children uh, and, and adults that have children might become a little bit overwhelmed, right? And in, in an attempt to ease that burden, there might be an attempt to escape reality. And that's done through what we saw, um, uh, you know, trading the minivan or for a convertible, or um, that might even be infidelity, right? We, we saw risky behaviors. So things that we find people with history of depression are likely to face these midlife tasks more negatively than those who, um, who do not uh, have marital stability and satisfaction. Okay, for the most part, um, but they should increase in midlife, right? They, 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 we find that it's not just because of age, but often because by this point, the married couple uh, would probably have an increase in number of shared friends, right? So what happens with shared friends? We have, we have um, increased support, right? So pros of of uh, the pros in the relationships there, there are increased support. Not just, not just uh, you know, we look at support as emotional. So we want emotional support. We want uh, financial support too, right? Why financial? Why is financial important in a relationship? If you think back to Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, right? We have our, our basic needs that we, that we really need to have in order to uh, achieve the next level, like self-esteem issues and feelings of belonging. Financial really provides us with a sense of safety and security. So let's use, use the uh, traditional model of uh, a married couple, right? If we have two individuals that are married together and both are earning about the same amount of, of income, um, they, they might feel secure in that. If they both have good retirement plans that they're going to be able to both benefit from, that's going to keep them safe and secure in that relationship, right? But yeah, I, if- I'm sorry. Yeah, I think uh, uh, they can, yeah, they can, uh, the financial, uh, the financial, I mean, the money, they can make them enjoy their life. 
Right, right. And that's you can that's, have good time, yes. Exactly. Without, so that's quality stress. of life. That's quality of life satisfaction. Absolutely. And and in relationships, that's going to be important. So um, if there if there's more financial stress and less support in the financial realm, that could be a problem. That could uh, increase the um, uh, likelihood that they're gonna they're gonna maybe take a little bit more risky behaviors and step outside that relationship and and do things they wouldn't normally do. Okay, um, increased number of friends. Okay, so friends again kind of goes back into that support. They have an increased number of shared friends that would allow greater satisfaction and good health, uh, a good healthy social circle that would be adequate um, for for problem solving. Right. So, um, you know, what we tend to see, and this isn't, this isn't universal, um, couples that have different friends, um, they might be in different support networks and that could be problemsome. So I'm not saying that it's necessary to have all the same friends, but ones that have a, like a dichotomy, like uh, one partner has one side of friends, uh, another partner has a whole different uh, class of friends. They really don't share anything together. That might indicate, that might be a good indication that their relationship isn't really as cohesive and, and um, that could lead to maybe potential problems or a rupture in that relationship. But because we know that even though they, they may fight, uh, a lot of couples do fight and they have disagreements, it's not gonna be the end of the world um, uh, because they have a good support uh, good mutual support to pr help them problem solve that, right? Because they've done it before. And we often find that middle-aged women are better able to cope with divorce than younger women. And, and we find that this, again, can be due to the experience that is brought about um, or uh, facilitated through life, okay? Um, and, and even dealing with, with husbands. And again, that's looking at the, uh, the traditional, the, the uh, male and female relationship, we do see the women uh, tend to do that because they might have a little bit more in tuneness with their relationship, with their, I'm sorry, with their, their emotions. Now we are seeing a shift in, in recent decades with that. We are seeing that men who are um, enduring relationship issues uh, might be a little bit more in tune with their emotional side, right? Because we know that from mental health, we know that women in mental health are likely to go seek help than men are, right? And that's, uh, that uh, traditionally that has been gender role expectations. But we are seeing a little bit of a shift in that. We're seeing that mental health uh, counseling is a little bit better accepted with, with males, with men uh, than, than previously understood to be, right? Um, but anyway, um, but parents uh, in midlife, typically experience a sense of depression and anxiety and possibly even heightened uh, chance of divorce. Um, and this is often when children leave home, okay? Which brings me to my next point in what we know as empty nest syndrome, okay? And again, this is not universal. A lot of couples, a lot of uh, families may negotiate this a little bit differently. You know, for me, example, I've got, uh, I've got four kids and uh, my last one is graduating this year. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm experiencing an empty nest and while it's going to be a little bit different for me around here, I'm excited to see him go because that means freedom for me, right? But uh, you ask mom, uh, mom's going to be a little bit different, you know, that, that's her baby. And um, so anyway, that might be a strain on relationships and being able to talk through them is going to be important. Um, but uh, it, it kind of brings my other point to this with relationships is sometimes divorce is a consequence of empty nest syndrome, okay? Uh, why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Why would divorce be a likely consequence of empty nest syndrome? What we know is empty nest syndrome. Because if the kids are leaving, there's nothing really holding the parents together anymore. Like there's right. nothing to bond over. Right, exactly. When you think of a marriage, we a lot of them are focused on children. Right? 
So we, we have the, the, the child uh, in the home. They're both uh, caring for that child. The, maybe the uh, one partner is earning extra dollars, doing overtime to help support that, that uh, child. And when that child leaves home and no longer needs that support, and that partner is kind of left with that void as to what do I do next? And uh, two partners, two uh, people, individuals that are in that couple might experience some uh, strain with that because now they have more time together. Their purpose has shifted. Okay, so maybe the child, uh, maybe that uh, that um, uh, child got married, or they just simply moved out or went to college. Now, if the parenting and the family was done well during these previous stages, uh, then they did not neglect their roles as as partners or either wives or husbands or, or whatever. But if they devoted entirely most of their their being uh, uh, as being a mother or a father or or whatever, now the child is gone. It could present a sense of confusion. OK, so confusion as to what the purpose of that relationship is. So if we don't have purpose in that relationship, that could also lead into heightened anxiety, depression, right? Because now we don't know what we're doing. We're locked into this relationship and we don't know why. And now a majority of women are happy when they reach this milestone, again, because they feel that they, they could uh, reconnect with their spouses in different ways. However, this is not always the case. Um, in 1970, I'll kind of throw some stats up here for you. In 1970, uh, I think your book kind of reflected this too. Um, uh, 80%, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 8% of 25 uh, year olds um, were, 25 uh, year olds in the U US lived with their parents, okay? That number seems pretty high, right? 25 year old, sorry. So that number seems pretty high. So that's really shifted. It's actually gotten a little bit higher. As of 2000, latest statistics is 2010, we had twice more than, than double that uh, same age that lived with their parents. So about 20% at that age. Now, despite the economy, uh, possibly getting better, we find that there are different levels of responsibility that are seen by emerging adulthood. Uh, there's also something that is called midlife uh, squeeze, which I'll, I'll get into here in just a second. But um, as you can see, you know, we, we have more uh, children living with parents a little bit longer, and that could be for various reasons. Maybe they're going to school, maybe they're going to college and living at home. So that could be a reason. Uh, kids are smarter these days, right? They, they don't want to. I, I remember when I was 18, I couldn't wait to get out of the house and live on my own. We're seeing a kind of a shift in dynamics uh, with that. Uh, males, not so much. I think males, we still have that gender role expectation, get out, get jobs. Um, but we are, we are seeing an increase of uh, age that uh, of males living at home too. But I thought this is a sharp contrast to kind of show with uh, uh, with, with females, uh, just a 40 year gap there. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense to you. So next thing I want to highlight is the midlife squeeze. Um, so the midlife squeeze, and th this is where individuals who are in, uh, middle adulthood, they're in between, uh, they're, really they're, they're understanding their health and working with their parents, their elderly parents, and then they're feeling the pressure of children who may be demanding attention um, or, or just, you know, um, kind of ev everything is coming down on that individual. So they're dealing with their elderly parents, maybe health issues uh, and financial issues and finding them suitable living arrangements. And they're dealing with their, their children moving out or demanding more, maybe getting married and having to um, support them financially uh, for, for weddings or college or whatever. So um, one of the terms we're gonna use here is multi-generational caregivers. So 
So multi-generational caregivers, put simply, it's middle-aged adults who provide assistance to their parents uh, and adult children at the same time, okay? And this could come for many reasons, right? Um, despite maybe already having a career, this may present a type of burden on the individual and uh, poor health habits are often due to challenges that are presented um, in, in financial burden, burdens of caring for both. And not only the financial, but emotional responsibilities are there sometimes too. So uh, finances become an issue. Um, emotional burden. Um, time management becomes an issue. Because if you're expected to be multi places, uh, multiple places at different times, that might be a, a difficult thing for them to negotiate, right? Um, but they may have responsibilities outside the house, like working. It might be difficult for that person to get home and enjoy time with their spouse, right? So that could be a drag on the relationship. And not to mention the physical toll that it would take as, um, as grandparenting uh, often starts uh, in the middle age as well, right? So... Um, we look at midlife squeeze as, as kind of dividing, just put simply, division of time or division of, uh, of responsibilities. Oops. Between two generations. Responsibilities. Did I get that right? Responsibilities. Okay. I think that's right. Um, so it, it, and it's kind of, it's kind of frightening for me to think of this because, you know, I'm 44 years old. Um, but many of you that are in this, how many of you are grandparents currently? I, I think I talked to a couple of you and you might be, I think in this class, right? How many of you are grandparents? Nobody. We don't have any grandparents in this class. Okay. I'm not a grandparent yet. Luckily. Now I'm, I'm kind of hoping to keep it that way. Right. Indeed, I am. Remember the oh, baby. You are, Billy. That's right. I, I talked to you this week about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. So, um, you know, very, very, uh, fun time for, for a lot of you that, uh, how, how do you feel being a, a young grandparent? It could be exciting, right? It could be daunting, right? Yeah, but interesting, yeah. interesting fact is that one third of adults become grandparents by late 40s. I'm just going to put GP by uh, late 40s. Okay. That's a little scary, right? Because I, I'm 44 and, and that, that's kind of frightening. I have... Uh, uh, actually, I have a cousin of mine. Um, she's a little bit, actually, she's about the same age, but she got started a little bit earlier in life. And she's already, uh, she's not only a, a grandparent, she's, um, yeah, um, her child, how'd that work? Her child is, yeah, she's a great grandparent, weirdly enough. I'm trying to think how that worked. Maybe I have that wrong. No, no, no. My uncle is a great grandparent. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that that's kind of frightening for me to think that, you know, uh, but again, that, that kind of just leads us back to our own mortality and facing that. Right. Another interesting statistic is that, um, 92% express high levels of satisfaction with this role. Right. That's, that's pretty, you know, if you think about it, it we're, we're, when we're on this half of, of, uh, grandparenting, um, we really don't think that we're going to be excited about it, right? I'm kind of uh, getting anxious just thinking about being a grandparent. But um, once they become grandparent, a lot of them express high satisfaction. Right? Why? Why do you think that would be? Why do you think that would be? What would be satisfaction about being a grandparent? I can tell you what I feel like is satisfaction of being a grandparent. Like you okay. did your job and you're, you, you, you successfully raised a child and now they're going to start that path. Right, right. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road. You've been training your, your children your entire life, right? Uh, their entire lives 
to, um, to, to, to come into this, to become parents. And when you see that happen for the first time, a lot of grandparents, new grandparents, understand that this is a great role to be in, right? Because now you get to enjoy the benefits of having kids uh, and then being able to give them back. You know, that's a, at least that's what my mom told me, right? She was a, a, a great mom, you know, but she was, she was done being a mom when, when I had left. I think I had stretched her a little too thin. Um, but uh, when I brought kids around, she loved being in that grandparent role, right? Uh, but grandparents, you know, we have this stereotypical image of grandparents being warm and caring. And sometimes we find that people become grandparents at this age are often uh, kind of cold and distant, right? Um, then, then this is uh, believed to be due to the fact that they may still be working and not having time to bake cookies, right? Like the traditional thing that we saw uh, or we know of our grandparents, our grandmother uh, doing, right? Uh, but for them, uh, uh, others suggest that there might be uh, a fear of aging, right, Le and reluctance to accept that uh, this is their role uh, in their life during their their mid uh, midlife, their career issues or whatnot, whatever they have going on. Um, but uh, this this kind of brings me to our next discussion of midlife career issues. Because right about this age, we're still working, right? We're, we're still um, going to our jobs and we're crushing it, right? We're, we're trying to build up wealth. We're trying to build up sustainability, or maybe we're just trying to pay our bills, right? Um, but as I talked about, financial stability really plays a factor on, on how, we, um, how we negotiate this, this midlife stage, right? Um, but what we find... Uh, especially in high demand careers is a thing called burnout. Now burnout, it's probably a term that you've heard before. Uh, it's a lack of energy uh, um, from uh, formed from exhaustion that is typically seen in younger adults. But we find that the experience that uh, has come from earlier stages now allows us to really pace ourselves better, right? So Burnout is really a, a lack of energy job exhaustion and not just job really life exhaustion we might see life exhaustion too right um, and maybe even a little bit of pessimism in there right might see that a little bit later on in age. We, uh, you know, that that really results from chronic stress uh, from things that uh, that we're enduring, right? Um, but we we uh, we might be a little bit more preoccupied with life expectations, uh, but nonetheless, we do find, um, you know, with our life expectations, we may feel like we're supposed to fill certain roles or we're supposed to be, um, ex oops, expectations. Now, what, what might some of these expectations be drawn from? Where do you think we get our expectations of where we should be in our life? Let, let me give you an example. So I, I just recently had dinner a couple of weeks ago with a high school buddy of mine um, who uh, left his job recently um, and is sailing his 80 foot yacht down to Florida where he has no job and just bought a $1.5 million home. Um, now, it was great catching up with this guy, but I'll tell you what, it, it really kind of got me thinking, you know, holy cow, you know, how is he, what, he, it, we were both in band together. He was a tuba player. I was a tuba player. And uh, so we kind of went through the same life uh, things together. Our families, we were neighbors together. So everything right down the line was, was very similar. And somewhere after, after uh, high school, he went off a different path than, than I did. And I'm just watching, you know, he's a single guy. He's, he's really, uh, he's really crushing it in life. He's doing some really great things. You know, that, that kind of, 
made me compare myself a little bit to him. You know, we both have very similar personalities. So why don't I have an 80 foot yacht, right? So life expectations really comes when we start comparing others that are with us. Uh, maybe uh, same gender, uh, same age, same upbringing, same hometown, right? Um, life expectations really come from, oops, our, our uh, environment or culture, right? So if we have relatives that um, uh, culture or family values, we may have relatives that expect us to um, be in a certain role at a certain age, right? Or, or take on the family business, right? So those expectations really come from, from different places. Could be, and we may see that in our workplace, we may see that in, in our friends that we have, um, but uh, having the tendency to talk and negotiate and address these issues um, tend to be a problem for, for men. Whereas women, again, in midlife, they're more likely to withdraw and sometimes complain collectively with coworkers, uh, but uh, not necessarily generating a change in this. Um, you know, this is really important. Now, what can we do to change? When I'm working with individuals that are experiencing some kind of midlife crisis or they're experiencing any kind of crisis for that matter, um, I really look at them to uh, see what we can change. I'm very solution focused in, in my practice. So I want to see what can we do to either alter our perception or alter our environment. Those are really the, the two best options that you have because what we don't have control over is time. We can't stop from getting older. We don't really have a lot of control over our medical conditions, especially when it comes to medical loss. You know, For example, diabetes, we see that uh, on that uh, in middle adulthood. That's not something we can necessarily change. However, we can increase the quality of life by improving um, what, they're, what they're really doing, okay? So how are they eating? How are they exercising and lessening that condition? That's really where that solution focus comes, comes through. So my point in bringing that up is that midlife crises, uh, they may or may not happen, but we do know that people with depression and anxiety earlier in life may experience some of these features that we saw, uh, that we talked about a little earlier, okay? Um, any questions? Does, does anybody have any, anything that they would like to ask or, or add to this? Okay. All right, so that is really all that I have for today. I'm gonna stop recording.